Well, far and away, the most frightening thing is just even showing up for me. Um, far and away. Although there have been a couple of times, largely during the growing season, where I didn't totally feel <coughs> safe there based on the numbers and just sort of the uh, general vibe of the crowd. Nothing particularly directed at me, but just it, it just wasn't a comfortable thing. Um, probably the most rewarding thing is just getting to know some of these people a little bit. It's been a real eye-opener for me, even the ones that are frustrating and it doesn't go anywhere, if you will. It's been quite an eye-opener for me, I, I have to use that word, for living in this community and having that whole parallel community that I really have not had any knowledge to. And that, I think, has been good. Um, been a lot of smiles. I can't think of anything particularly funny that has happened. Um, the confusing is just trying to figure out what to what to say to some of these people who it seems are much more <laughs> informed than I am in a lot of ways. So I guess that's about it for me. Well, I seem to feel comfortable with the approach to people at the square. And <coughs> I feel like that uh, they get at ease with me real fast and they start talking. But where the confusion comes in, we start talking about God. <coughs> and two different experiences I've had is um, they turn, they believe in God, they believe um, in his death and his resurrection, but then they go off on, um, one guy said, uh, Jesus didn't die on the cross, but he died in England and began the royal family, Diana being one of the results. And then I got my Bible out and I read about the crucifixion, and he said, well, when the darkness of three hours happened, it was because a flying saucer was hovering over and stated Jesus was a supernatural guy. And that was like, I just didn't even know what to say after that. I mean, he was very friendly and very nice. Um, but after I got home, I, I realized that probably I should have prayed with him. But I didn't really, you know, I, I, had, I was kind of backed up in the corner with confusion. I just didn't know how to handle that. And then a few weeks later, I met another one. Second time I had talked to her. And, of course, she believed in everything that we talked about. And I kind of brought God in, like looking around the square and saying, all these people here, I said, isn't it? remarkable that Jesus loves every one of them and he loves you and me he just loves us all isn't that remarkable and then we started talking about God and Jesus and <coughs> she started talking like she believed in him and all of this and that but then she went on to st start talking about the Bermuda Triangle pyramids underneath the pyramids was older pyramids and they had this electrical thing magic thing and uh, too bad all the redwood trees around here was cut down because half human creatures used to live in them it's like oh my goodness here we go again <laughs> and I wasn't sure what to say you know I just didn't have the words to uh, say to her she was very friendly very nice and uh, it was easy to approach her and talk to her I more or less get them at ease and then let them talk but then that's where I need somebody like Sandy who comes right back at them you know with scripture She's very good at that, and <coughs> I, you know, I missed having her there both times. Anyway, that's my story, one of them, two of them anyway. Let, let's start right there, because uh, I'm not going to be able to remember all of this by the time we get to the end. Um, first off, anytime somebody starts off on a weird tangent, remember that one of our objectives is to ask questions. Ask questions, find out where they are. So when they start off on some strange tangent, like either one of those situations, uh, I might ask something like, well, let me ask you this. Do you believe the Bible is true? 
because that's going to bring it back to Scripture. Do you believe that's the foundation for the Christian faith, is the Bible? Okay, you profess to, be, to believe in God, to believe in the Son of God, His death, burial, and resurrection. Uh, so do you believe that's the foundation of the Christian faith? Okay. Do you find any place in the Bible that talks about these things? Name them specifically. Is there anything like that? Or where, where is anything like that that relates back to the Christian faith? And if, if you don't do anything else, you're going to get people to think about what they're saying. And what's happening is, is what we call syncretism. Syncretism is mixing of religions and beliefs, non-beliefs. Uh, we've talked about it with regard to the Native Americans. Native Americans mix it with animism, which is a form of ancestral worship. It seems to me that a lot of people on the street have mixed uh, little pieces of Christianity with little pieces of Buddhism, with little pieces of New Age, with little pieces of mysticism regarding the, the whole UFO world, uh, whatever it might be, or all of the above, that they, they come up with that. So I would try to get back to some foundation some foundation that, that, that is of the Christian faith. So you, from what I understand, you believe in God. You believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And the foundation of that is the Bible. So do you believe the Bible is true? And then w once you get an agreement, so you're asking a question there that because you have laid it out, or if you lay it out like I did, you've said this, you've said this, you've said this, now, do you believe the Bible is tr also true, that it, that is the foundation of the Word of God? So she's gone back and she said yes to the things that you know. So One of the things that I try to do is if somebody has, has said two or three things that are right, is go back to those things and get them to affirm those things. Then go back and say, well, we need a foundation for that because really what's happening is they're getting away from the foundation of the faith. So I go back. I would go back to the Bible. So well, then, do you do you believe the Bible is true? And because the Bible is the foundation of that of the Christian faith, we ask. Well, do you find any of those other things you talked about, the Martians or whatever it is, uh, anywhere to be found in the Bible? And if not, where did you get? Where where is the foundation for that? Uh, and and get them to have to make some. And if it's well, I just read it, or I just well, is that. How do we know that's true? Because I, I, have, I have a way of, of saying that I, I know the Bible is true, and I have, I have some strong evidence that the Word of God is true, but how do we know those things are true? It sounds almost like science fiction, you know, rather than fact. Um, so that's, that's where I would go with that. I'll tr always try to get back to some foundation, some foundation. And then, and then you can you can say, well, that, if the found, if the foundation of Christianity is the Word of God, why don't we talk about that? Uh, in, in, with regard to the Christian faith, uh, because what's happening is is, and I I know I met a lady in the credit union one time that was just had mixed Buddhism, Hinduism. She wouldn't claim Hinduism, but she was proclaiming Hindu thought, Hindu philosophy, uh, as well as Christianity. And so then you, you've got all of this stuff kind of running out there, which are incompatible. And what they've done is they've taken a little smorgasbord, a cafeteria approach to their faith. Uh, I like this. I kind of like this story. That sounds cool. And, and they've mixed all that together to come up with whatever. And, and I, it's one of the reasons I keep asking people on the square, well, what about truth? What about what's true? And how do we know what you're saying is true? Um, so th that's, that's kind of how I would take that. Um, okay. Go ahead. Um, if you want to wait until this at the end, one of the things that I found, and because I spoke with the same lady um, a different day, and the, the three, there are th three people that I have had um, more than one conversation with or a deep enough one to where it kind of and for all of them it seems that they started out being brought up in what 
seems to be, I mean, even as they're telling it, from my knowledge, a pretty mainstream Christian type um, family mm -hmm. situation, whatever. But then due to hypocrisies or misuses of biblical stuff, um, often by people close to them, they've kind of like turned really away and it and it's it's hard for me i mean a lot of times because they're i've been amazed at how much scripture a lot of them know yeah. and it's like they have more knowledge than i do as far as even trying to come back to you know to be able to when they're going the what about and i was thinking when linda was talking about the the um, flying saucer and stuff and it's I now I didn't hear it from that lady our conversation went differently but I've I have heard through the years that those people who think that it's they'll when you ask them well where do you read about that in the Bible it'll go back to the flying creature in Ezekiel I think it is you know and you know and so I mean it's kind of like I'm going I'm trying to make sense with these people and they're smarter than I am, I, you know. Well, let's let's take that as an example, because and, and realize that a lot of the things we're addressing today, I'm going to try to address with uh, principles rather than maybe specifics of a situation. But uh, but in this case, I want to try to do both. The principle there is to get back to what what sc the scripture is actually talking about. Now. In Scripture, as I've talked to all of you about before, you have things that are very literal. You have things that are prophetic. Uh, the things that are prophetic many times have symbols associated with them. But assigning anything to those symbols without, without substance, without a standard by which to do that, can be dangerous. And so when you're talking about the wheels uh, of Ezekiel being flying saucers, I, frankly, I've never even heard of that. But let's, let's deal with it. Um, so can you get rid of that sound? It's bugging. Just turn it down on the thing, yeah. Um, it, it, I found too, David, if you just put those muffle those ears together, the, the sound goes away. Push them together. Um, try to think where I was, that when you're dealing with those kind of issues, you've, you've got to say, well, how, how, do you, um, how do you link things together? How do you link together the idea of a flying saucer with the wheel of Ezekiel? Because that's not what Bible scholars throughout the centuries have talked about with regard to what this is. And, and we get back to what you know, and I, I quite often I'll take it off of me and put it onto the the experts. And even when I was dealing with this guy that was last week, you heard me talk about what well, the scientists say. Uh, Einstein said, Tulsa, uh, Tesla said, you know, all of these kinds of things are things that you want to be able to go back to. So what I've done is if I, as I come off the square, I take time afterwards to debrief myself. Now, what I would have done in each of those situations is go right back there to that room that's full of commentaries and pull a commentary off for Ezekiel, look up and see what, what the commentators are talking about there in terms of the interpretation of the prophecy, the interpretation of the vision, so that, you have, so that you've got something for next time in your pocket. And, I, and I, I do this every week. I mean, this isn't something just for you guys. I, every week I come off with, okay, how could I have done that better? And I'll go right back there and sit down, pull books off the shelf. And if it, they've made a reference to a particular scripture, I'm going to go find that and, and look at what, what, are the, what are the real scholars saying about what this is about. And then look what is their foundation for that. So that you can say, you know, the foundation of the biblical scholars is this for their interpretation of this. And then, you, then you've got, and see, this, this, is, this is just taking what we're doing out on the square, not just an activity, but something that I'm, I'm going to actually bone up on. I'm actually going to become better at. Because 
the thing that I think all of us have found that once you hear something like that, you hear something similar again because they're talking to each other too. And so they get what well, I heard so-and-so say, and they said it was the foundation of that or the, the source of that was this, and, and I'll just grab that. And, and then you've got this, the same kind of thing going, and next time it'll be a little different spin on it, but you're going to have the same basic premise. So principally, I would just say, okay, just like Linda has done, she's got herself some notes there of what actually was, took place. When you've got, when you've got it down, head down and just sit down and look. And then if you want to sit down and talk with me about that afterwards, I, I'm delighted to do that. But that's what these resources are for in the library. If we come across an apologetic issue, which this is really just theological issues that we're talking about now, you come across an apologetic issue, which is, let me, let me just say, what, what's happening so far in the conversations here? These are people that started out, uh, as, as Carol said, probably in a Christian home, to some degree Christian some Christian doctrine, but may not be sound Christian doctrine. They've become uh, disillusioned, um, hurt, uh, even harmed in some way in some cases by those in the church, and that has been a radical turn for them. They're, these are personal issues, not theological issues. They're personally hurt, so they rebel. And then they take pieces of stuff and put it together that doesn't make any sense. And this whole idea of mixing faiths, mixing religions, mis mixing philo some strange New Age philosophy with Christian doctrine or Mormon doctrine or Jehovah's Witness doctrine or Muslim doctrine is still just mixing things up. It's not coming back to the Christian faith. So I would just say, you know, take, take 30 minutes and, and come into the church and sit down back there and, and the, the books, as you walk in that door, they start at Genesis on your left and go around the room all the way to Revelation. So you can start Old Testament, New Testament, all the way to the end. And you can find something there if it's a theological issue like that or somebody's mixing their faith. Uh, they come back with some um, prophetic symbol like you're talking about here that really has no bearing to any kind of truth or, or even close to a decent interpretation. Uh, but here, here is what the theologians are saying. Here's what the, the real biblical scholars say about that. And then if you see that same person on the square again, you can, the best way to go about it is to walk up and say, you know, I've been thinking about that. Can we continue that conversation we started? And then you've got some, some foundation to go back to. So is that helpful? I mean, if you just, you've got to do the background work after the event. If you just let it hang, then you, you come away feeling like, well, I'm still ill-equipped to handle that. But if you just come do your homework, and that's what I brought all these books for, is for us to have some resources to come back and, and really pull it out. And, and then you can make specific reference. You know, well, I was reading the other day uh, Williamson, and Williamson, the, the, th the great theologian uh, from England, said, Here's what he understands the, that the wheels of Ezekiel are. And, and this is pretty much a standard of the belief system within the Christian faith. So uh, to come back to what the scriptures say and what the theologians uh, say with regard to interpretation, and this is why they believe that, which is what you're going to get in commentaries. You're going you're gonna to see, this is, they're not just going to say, well, this is the right interpretation. They're going to say something along the lines, well, this is why. Uh, I've come to this conclusion. So you're going to get a good solid foundation. Now, those are all people that may have started with some Christian roots or, or say to begin with, yeah, I believe in God. I believe that Jesus was dead, died and, and was resurrected. I believe those things. So now we've got some area of agreement. Let's start with the area of agreement. So as, as I understand it, what you're saying is you believe in God. You believe that Jesus was the Son of God, and he, was, he, he died on a cross, he was buried, he resurrected from the grave. Uh, is all that true? Yeah. Uh, then go back and start looking for that foundation. Well, do you believe the Bible to be the Word of God as, as the Christian faith holds? Well, yeah. Okay. Well, can we, can we go to back to what the Bible has to say? And then if they go to some, you know, prophecy is probably the hardest thing to deal with. So when you're dealing with Ezekiel, or some things in Daniel, even some things in Isaiah or Revelation, 
you're, you're dealing in some stuff that I'm not even going to remember probably uh, moment to moment, but I can come back and get a handle on it. And, and like I say, I, I do that every week. I probably, I spend a lot more time doing that probably than I, than, uh, than I should with regard to other stuff I need to be doing. But I'll spend a couple hours. I mean, but if you'll spend 30 minutes in the, in the commentary room, you'll, you'll find some answers to your questions for stuff like that. So any time, anything that's rooted in a scriptural answer has been misinterpreted, go to the commentaries on it. Okay. All right. What else do we have? Yes. Sorry. That's a great point. I feel what you're saying is to come back because I have spoke with many people out there, and and I will walk away thinking about or or wanting to research it and get back to them and, and see them again. You know been a lot of rewarding times um, but a lot of times I feel you know where I, maybe I've fallen well of course I've fallen short and, and I didn't maybe pray with them or even last week a guy was asking for a Bible and I should have you know what I mean I had a King James Bible mm-hmm. there I should have went ahead and gave uh, him I've King always James got Bible. New Testaments with me if you I'm know, out there I'll always have New Testaments yeah I didn't yeah, and um, he said he wanted to speak to me at the end again, and I did, you know, speak with him. I'm just hoping to see him again. And uh, as Carol's saying, too, there's a lot of people that are very knowledgeable on the Word, and 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 sometimes, you, well, a lot of times I will just listen, but then uh, there are times when they will have parts and pieces, mm-hmm. and they will go on to something. Uh, this one guy, he's like, have you ever heard of, he kept going back to thinking that it was a, a lineage thing, you know, like a family thing, of the, you know, like have you ever heard the name Sin, and he kept going back to what his last name was, and I didn't want to ever be rude. I talked to him a few times, and I said, well, it really has nothing to do with your lineage, you know, or your ancestors, you know, or any, uh, you know, kind of, I almost... Uh, conceived it or uh, understood him to say it was kind of a generational curse or something, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. His last name was uh, something, you know, something like this. Was it a Jewish last name? Or was it maybe no, like I, f- I think it was something uh, maybe like priest or something like that or, you know, I'm not sure what it meant. But he, I talked to him a few times and Jim did as well. And he he knew quite a bit of scripture, but he he was raised by maybe uh, like a you know a, you know Mongols or that like maybe the Hell's Angel type of mm-hmm. families. Who anyway, I I got to speak to him quite a bit and was hoping to see him again. And then then other times there are other people that um, all I will get to be able to do is kind of cite the Roman road to them and come in agreement with that and and um, you know if and, and if I can go back to the book Unsilenced which is great and helps mm-hmm. me I've read it a couple times good. but it's uh, it's good to stay fresh in that myself to know exactly how to respond to a lo- you know some of the, the questions they may have and that yeah. as well. Well, let, let's talk about the the lineage thing because I, I think that's an, that's another area that I've heard at least once, maybe more than once, that and it wasn't on a curse side, but it was you know th- that they were somehow blessed by their lineage. But it all comes back to the same issue: is the lineage issue. And and as we've talked about on Sunday morning, Christ changed all of that. It's the re- one of the reasons the Pharisees hated him is because he was saying that. That, th- that he was the fulfillment of those things and that he came to provide adoption and, and, uh, and sight to the blind and salvation to the Gentiles, I mean, is a, is a way to put it. And, and so the lineage that the Pharisees looked to for their salvation was, was broken. Uh, it, it, God's chosen people are the Jews, but it has nothing to do with who is acceptable in the kingdom or who can be forgiven. If, if somebody's talking about a generational curse, one of the things that immediately comes to mind for me is what, uh, 
what is the resolution of that, do you think? And the resolution is going to be found in Christ. Christ provides forgiveness for us no matter what, what the sin has been, no matter what our fathers and mothers have done, what generation we live in. There's no, there's no but in there. Christ provides salvation for everyone, but that's, nev- that's never there. So uh, it would come back to, to that kind of a, a stance for me. And then you can go right back to the most common scripture of all with regard to our salvation, John three sixteen, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever would believe in him, and that's Gentile, Jew, Greek, barbarian, uh, anybody from any walk of life anywhere. So, uh, and, and then I would just dig into, it, have you lived under the, the thought that you somehow are hopeless because of this generational thing or whatever it is that they're they're talking about because that's what concerns me the most when I talk to people is if they feel like well there's just there's no choice for them there's no hope for them so if we can get to to that point then we've got a place to to start to talk to somebody because you know, when, one of the things that happens when people do this kind of thing, when they say these kind of things, they're, they're throwing stuff out that is um, totally antithetical to the Christian faith, but somehow they've had some attachment to and they've developed a belief just from the repeated story line. If nothing else, it's become ingrained. If you, if you want to put it this way, they've invested in that story. Now, now my pride is on the line. I'm invested in this. Uh, and that, that's a hurtful place to be because if people feel hopeless, there's not, uh, there, there's not, you know, they don't feel like there's anything that can save them. They don't feel like there's anything that's good for them. Uh, that, they're, that hopeless g- genuinely does mean hopeless. So that, that's to come back to this is what the word of God has to say, this is the, the Christ is for everyone, that there's, there's no one hopeless. Uh, we've, we've all sinned and gone astray, but there's no one that's hopeless uh, because of the power and the, the goodness and the nature of God. So well, the, to me, that's one of the scariest things is when somebody goes, well, there's just, there's just no hope for me because I, I want to be able to go back to them and say, let, let's let's continue that conversation again, can we? And and you know, I've been thinking about this, and I just I want to say some things to you that are that are really important. So. I was able to speak to him uh, a couple times after that, and did express more or less did express what you're saying. There is it has nothing to do with our lineage. Good. It's just a matter of you know faith, belief, you know, and uh, he kind of, there was just a few spots that he didn't want to openly accept or what, but he's, uh, you know, I'll still see him again, and there's a lot of people that I hope to see, you know, know, I always leave there thinking, for sure, there's something that... You know, again, uh, this this room is inviting you to just either come away and do what Linda's done and just write down what you can remember uh, you know, the whole end of my notes for today really is what I wrote down last time I was out there. I came back, I spent about probably 45 minutes just writing notes and then going back and, and thinking through, okay, how do, I, how do I need to approach this better? I did a lot of things well. I, I, I allowed some things to get out of hand that I could have handled better. And I just walked through those in my mind and dealt with the scripture that needs to be talked about. And then, you know, made myself some notes, and I'll be better prepared next time I go out. And every time I go out, that's what I come back. No matter if the encounters have been brief, or if they've been long, or if they've been really antagonistic, or if they've just been kind of friendly, uh, I'll come back and do the same thing because I want to be better every time I go out. If I represent Christ, I want to get better at it than I am currently. Uh, the Bacardo book is excellent in terms of that because he keeps us asking questions. So as I understand it, this, I'm going to ask you this. Do you agree with these things? Yes. Well, then, do you also agree with that? Because now you've got them shaking their head, yes, I do agree, I do agree, I do agree. And then 
plant the, the word of God on or some foundation to start with. So, okay. Well, let's, let's go to the, uh, the primary issue at hand I wanted to talk about, and that's, uh, and I, I appreciate the stories because that help, is very helpful. It, it helps me understand kind of what I need to talk about to you guys more, but, but don't just look at, at each other or me as the only resource. Go, go to the experts. It's like, you know, David and I have been talking about a potential radio show. Uh, it's fine for me to get on there and kind of be the big deal locally, but if I can bring in the very best there is in the, anywhere in the world to that conversation for a local audience, and I have the ability to do that, why would I not do that? And that room's the same way. That's the, that's the very best that there is, is back there in that room. And, and there's, there's great resources for us just to be, become better at what we do. Okay, so I want to talk to you just for a few minutes about what is called a straw man, a straw man argument. Does anybody know what that is, straw man? You see it a lot of times in political things. You see it in debates of just about anything. Uh, if you've watch, if you watch the political debates, what? Uh, yeah, but I'm gonna, it's in a particular way, okay. Um, if you, even if you're not a political junkie and are not interested in the debates, after I describe this, watch the next debate, and then and listen for this to happen because it'll help you as you get out on the street. I don't care if it's a Democratic debate or a Republican debate. Just listen to what they do. A straw man is something that, that you build an argument based on a false premise, and you build a weak opponent. Now, let me give you an example. Straw man would be straight from, from my encounter last week. Well, my mother went to church all her life, and she gave to the church, and she never got anything back. And, and, and I'm, I'm on the street and living in a tent. Christianity never did anything for me as I was growing up. So what's he done? He's, he's, he's built an argument that, that, that this is what Christianity is. Now, my question is, is that what Christianity is? He was talking about, uh, and he used the phrase at one point, seed faith. Now, if you've ever watched seed faith, if you've ever watched Oral Roberts years ago, he'd talk about seed faith, which is totally unbiblical. It, it is, it's not a biblical principle. And, and we're going to actually some text Sunday morning that they use. So when we talk about quoting scripture, they'll quote that scripture from Luke. And, and, and then build this argument that, well, if I planted a seed into the church by giving money to the church, then I ought to get money. God will see that I get money back, pressed down, running over more abundantly than, when, than I gave it. And so there, they've quoted a little bit of scripture. They've taken it out of context. And they've built this very weak position of Christianity, which is easy to say, and my mama got nothing, and I got nothing, and everybody I know that's in that church got nothing, and therefore, it's a bunch of hooey. So a straw man is to build something with some degree of truth in it, because that's the best, that's the best attack of the enemy against the Christian. Uh, some truth in it, and then... As you go down the line, you, tell, you mix in a, a, a lie that makes, the, uh, makes that opponent, the straw man that you've built, very weak. And the idea is if you build a straw man, you can light a match to it and it'll burn up quickly. That, you, that you've built a, a weak argument, and you, then you go in and defeat that argument. And I got nothing, my mama got nothing, my mama's broke, she's poor, the church never did anything for her, nobody that... Christian community ever did anything for her, and therefore the, the whole thing's a bunch of junk. And he quoted straight out of Luke that I'm going to be dealing with. Yeah, use your mind, if you will. But so here, here, here's my point. It doesn't have to be just that. There, there are 
a million and one straw men that can be built. Well, I'll give you another one from last week. Well, the Bible is, has been proven to not be true because of the, the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls. And he goes on and he quotes, you know, all these people that have said this and, and talks about it. So he's built now, what is he? He's taken the Dead Sea Scrolls, he's made them something they are not, and now he's going to say the Dead Sea Scrolls defeat Christianity because they've proven Christianity in the Bibles is not true. And, and what we've got to do is be able to know enough or come back and educate ourselves on that. Now, th these are apologetic issues. They're in the back room. So when you're getting away from theology and into apologetic issues, like something to do with archaeological discoveries, those are, those are apologetic issues. Uh, creation versus evolution, apologetic issues. They're in the back room. So come back and do your research on those things. But, but here's, here's what they're doing. They're building a false premise of what Christianity is. And, and they're building that premise in a way that it's easily torn down and defeated. So they'll build it and then tear it down. And so here's the one thing you can do in that, in that case to always come out making them think a bit. Well, I'm sorry that you were raised in that church, and I'm sorry that that's your idea and understanding of Christianity, but that is not at all the Christian position. What you're suggesting is not Christian doctrine. Well, that's what I always grew up with. Well, that doesn't make, make it true. I'll give you another, another one that I hear a lot, and I've heard some of them here a lot. Well, you Christians all think you're just so good. And look what happened in the Crusades. All those Christians out there murdering people, right and left. That's not love. Just murdering people, right and left. So what It was leaders lying to people, just okay. like we sometimes get lied to. It's not what scripture says. They were doing what their leaders were telling them. They had lied to them and convinced them that what they were doing was right and according to God's will, and it is not. So let's see what the Bible has to say. Yeah, exactly. So here, here's, the, here's the argument. There's anybody can do anything in the name of anybody or anything, and that doesn't make it true with regard to what they're saying they represent. I could come out here and, and, and start harming people and, and cry out Allah Akbar. That doesn't make me a Muslim, and it doesn't make what I'm doing really attached to that faith. Now, I'm not making the argument that it doesn't. I'm just saying that that's, that's the reality. The same thing's true with Christi Christianity. But what is true concerning the Christian faith is what those people were doing during the Crusades in no way represented Christ or his teachings. And that is the foundation of the Christian faith. Not what somebody's done, but what Christ taught and what Christ represented to be true. So none of those things match up with the, the truth of the gospel. None of those things are true with regard to what Christ taught. So any, anybody can claim to be, to be representing anything and do evil things, but that doesn't mean that what they say they're representing, they actually are representing. And what, what happened in the Crusades? was an abomination to God. It was an abomination to God. It in no way represents God, his character, his nature, or his son. So what you've got to do is deconstruct the, the phony straw man that's been built. Instead of just going, well, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, 
but but we we all love each other and we really are good and our church is really nice you know that's that doesn't answer the question what it does answer the question is to take apart the straw man and to say but but that doesn't represent anything with regard to what god says or who he is or the nature of what god's word or what it says it has no, nothing to do with that and those people were wrong that what they did was an abomination to god it was hateful in god's eyes so we're we're taking apart the argument and bringing it back in the solid foundation of what's true in the in the word of god that's why as sandy said you always have to go back to the word you go back to the word what it says and not what somebody says it says so you deconstruct the straw man and go back to the Word of God. That doesn't make, make it true. That doesn't make it true. I mean, that's, that's a really easy thing to say. Well, what about truth? That doesn't make it true just because these people went out to Jesus and did all these things. It doesn't make it true. And it in no way represents what God says in his Word, his character, nature, or, or that of his Son. And, it, and everything that was done, I would agree with you, was an abomination to God. It in no way represents Christianity. So you see what's happening. They're building, they're building something. And what here's here's the argument came down last week. The guy would make my argument for me, creating a straw man, and then tear it down and look at me and say, "Well, explain that." And then he'd go right back in. And he'd build another case that he said was Christianity, and then he'd tear it down. And he'd say, see there? I mean, he just one thing after another after another after another. But they were all premised on building a false representation of Christianity. And a lot of that, as Linda was saying earlier, came out of his upbringing. His mother was involved in a Word of Faith movement church that taught if you give, you're going to get back. And so it was a formula. And here's, here's the danger of word of faith. You use it as a formula. You say, okay, I am premeditating now. Okay, I'm going to make God do what I want him to do by following what his word says. If you give, it will be given back to you, pressed down, running over. And what we think that means is that if I give money, that I'm going to get more money back, more than I got it from, from where I got it from, and it's going to be in abundance. That's, what, that's what the, the way that in Scripture is interpreted quite often. And that's not at all what it says. And again, we'll deal with this Sunday morning. But you've got to go back to what does the Word of God actually say. Now what do I, what do I need to do if I had that that conversation and had no idea what to do with it. Right back there. Pull some commentaries off off the shelf in the book of Luke on chapter six and seven and eight. And and read through the commentary and you'll go back with an answer. But that and I, as I told him, but but that's not that's not the position of the Christian faith. You know, I'm sorry that you had that experience. I'm sorry that church taught that. But because a church teaches something, or you bought something in a Christian bookstore and read it, doesn't make it true. What the Word of God teaches is the foundation of the Christian faith and nothing else. Can I can um, sit here. I'm trying to gather my thoughts. I'm sorry. From having spoken with him a couple of times and trying hard, I was distracted a couple of different times, so I didn't hear your entire conversation with him, but I, was, I caught a lot of it. Um, I could see the next thing being, well, then why should I take what you're saying to be what's correct? You know, because I mean that was yeah. part of his thing. And, and is that, that was each one saying, yeah, that, the correct that, line. that's right. And that was part of his argument. Well, you guys can't even agree on what what's true concerning the Bible. So, what makes you think you've got it right, essentially? Well, there. And as I explained to him, there are things in the Bible that aren't black and white, but there are those things that are absolutely black and white that we know are true, 
and are black and white in, in to the, every culture and every time and every place. And we know those things are true. And, and so let's talk about those things. I mean, we can talk about the wheels of Ezekiel all day long, but let's talk about the things that we know are true. Well, then when we got to that place and we started down that road, here's where he went. Well, I don't care what all that old stuff says. That's just old stuff. And he said the same thing after we got in the conversation about the Dead Sea Scrolls and we, and we started going back to what was actually in them and that I could show him documentation of this, that it's true. Then he said the same thing about that. Well, I don't care what they say anyway. I mean, that's thousands of years ago. So what I'm concerned about is right now, and I just believe we ought to look And we shouldn't get into these kind of conversations because it just divides people. And my, my comment to him was, well, if, if that kind of love that you're talking about is divided over us not agreeing on everything, that's a pretty weak love. The love of the Bible is not that kind of love at all. The love of the Bible doesn't say I have to look past these things. It transcends and overcomes those things and says, I love you in spite of whatever it is you believe, and I love you enough to tell you what I know to be the truth. And that's love. You know, you, you may not believe anything else about me, but the fact that I'm out here sharing what I believe this strongly to be true ought to tell you that this is rooted in love. And so if there's nothing else that's true, it's that kind of love that I say will be uh, victorious over any uh, shallow kind of love that it just demands that we all agree on everything or ignore each other. And even if I believe that doing that will send her to hell. And, it, and as I told him, if I believe what I'm saying I believe, if I genuinely believe what I say I believe, you've you got to at least say that what I'm doing here is sharing what I, what I believe will save you eternally. Even, even if you don't agree with it and don't believe it's true. And, and he, well, I, I just believe we should ignore those things and not worry about those things and just live in the here and now because I don't believe there's any eternity after, at the end after all. Well, that's fine. <clears throat> Two ways of dealing with somebody with, with those kind of strong personalities and beliefs. First time I'd ever talked with him was been, it's probably been two or three months ago. Uh, my encounter with him was very brief. And I'm not even sure it was the same walked up to him and started talking to him last week. The first time I chose to deal with him totally different way than I did this time. And, and he, it's because I asked this question. If I could show you and document that what I'm telling you is true and that it satisfied you in terms of your, your intellectual curiosity with regard to this, whatever the subject might be, if I could show you that what I'm saying is true and document it with scholars or archaeology or scientists and, and show you that what I'm saying is true, would it make any difference to you? Would it make any difference? Would you care that it's true? And the first time I had an encounter with him, he said, no, it wouldn't make any difference. Yeah. So... He said, no, it wouldn't make any difference. I said, fine, I'm, I'm, I'm glad to have talked to you. Have a good afternoon. And I walked away and went on to somebody else. Because that, that person right now has not reached the point in their life that they, they realize they have a need. And, and he is saying, essentially, nothing you can say is going to make any difference. I, I don't care if it's true. I'm, I choose to not embrace it. The old pearls before swine comes to mind. But when I talked to him this past time, he kept building these straw men, and I wasn't going to let him get away with that, and to, to walk away and let him think that's Christianity. Now, he didn't do that in the first time I talked with him. He did do it this time, and every time he'd build a straw man that was a false representation of Christianity, I, I thought, okay, I could, I could walk away with it right now, but... That's going to leave him with the impression that I agree with him that that's what Christianity is. And so every time he did, I would, I would deconstruct his straw man by saying that's not at all what the, 
this Dead Sea Scroll said. I can show you documentation from those that are actually doing the translation that will show you that, it, that those texts are word for word the Hebrew, what the Old Testament says. It is, aff it is affirming the, the Old Testament to be true. And then he was, well, okay, I want to go off on something else. He went off on, uh, uh, I asked him at one point, he, he was talking about things, um, everything had a cause. And I said, well, actually, that's not what the science just said. I said, and we've talked about this before in one of our Wednesday night classes. Scientists say everything that had a beginning has a cause. Because he was saying, well, scientists say everything has a cause, and everything has to have a, 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 a something that caused it to happen. So what caused God? You so smart. What caused God? And I said, well, actually, that's not what the science says. It, says, it doesn't say that at all. It says everything that has a beginning has a cause, and God didn't have a beginning, so he has no cause. He is self-cause. He is a self-existent uh, being. He doesn't have a cause. So what about that? Well, everything has a cause. Okay, I said, well, you, you think everything has a cause. So I said, well, then let me ask you a question. What caused the universe? Well, you, he said, you just said it, it had everything that has a beginning has a cause. And, and I've told you that he had already told me that everything, that he believed everything had a cause and that it, there was a beginning of the universe. He had already gone that route. So I said, well, you've already said that you believe the universe had a beginning. What caused that? Well, it was just kind of an accident. Stuff sort of bumped together and caused the Big Bang. And I said, well, when you say stuff kind of bumped together, what do you mean? Well, the stuff stuff, the space stuff. I said, well, there was no space. I said, Einstein said there, there, everything came out of nothing. There was no space. There was no time. There was no matter. There was no energy. He kept talking about energy. You know, this, this whole idea that he was going to... I said, well, what do you think is going to happen to you when you die to go back to Bricard's situation or question? And he said, well, I believe I, I, my energy just returns to the universe. Uh, I said, well, there was no energy at the beginning of the universe. So where did that energy come from? So, but every time he would get stuck, he'd take off on another argument. And it, it was obvious he's made these arguments a lot. But uh, every, everything that he put up there that took away from Christianity, I just sought to, to take apart from the standpoint of what he said he believed. Okay, you've said you believe that there's a, there was a beginning to the universe. And Einstein believed there was a beginning of the universe. So what was the cause? You said everything has a cause. What was the cause? Well, there was no stuff. There was no matter. There was no space. There was no time. There was literally no thing, nothing. And everything came about out of nothing. So what caused that? Well, they stuck off on Tesla, you know, the whole Tesla thing. Well, Tesla says that he created energy. I said, well... You know, that's not exactly what Tesla said, but let's talk about that. So we took off down that road. But every time he would say, well, things as being just sort of factual, this is the way it is. You have to look for the, the, the truth in, the, in that statement. Is there any truth at all in that statement, or is it not true? And if, it, if it's something like Tesla or Einstein's theories or whatever, you can find those in the back room in the, in the apologetic section. So just go, well, I mean, because you can get to a place you just go, well, you know, I don't know the answer to that. You're going to be here next week? We'll, we'll talk about it again. I'll go find out and come do a little research and find out. But look to take apart the straw man and, and expose it for what it is. In political things, what you see is pieces of truth attached to arguments with the people are making politically. Well, you said this, this, and this. Well, it might be true that person said this, this, and this, but it wasn't in the context of what they're presenting it. And so it sounds like a huge lie. So they've built a straw man, and then they attack the person on, on the straw man. And that's what this guy was doing. It's what I've heard over and over out there. The, the guy that's actually been to church here a couple times, the guy that calls himself Cool Whip. You know, he does the same thing. He presents 
a, a false uh, presentation of Christianity, and, and then he tears you apart for anything you don't believe that he presented. And what we've got to do is take that kindly, take that apart. Well, this and this you said is true according to the word of God. But then you said this, and that's not at all true. And he he makes, makes the argument from Genesis 3.18 that, that the herb of the ground is marijuana. And so he says that's the herb, and it's singular. He, kept, he keeps saying it's singular. Well, actually, it's not. It's singular in English, but it's not in the Hebrew. It literally means the herbage, the, all of the herbs of the ground. Uh, and, it, and actually, yeah, the flora or fauna. And if you look at other translation, it just says plants, plural. So, I mean, you've got you to just be willing to come back and do a little research and take it apart. Go back next time you see them and say, you know, and, and don't, don't tell them that's a straw man. Just, just deal with it, you know. But make up your mind how you want to, how you want, think you need to deal with those, whatever the argument is. And then if you want to sit down and talk about it, I'm, I would love to sit down and talk to, to, to you about it. Because that's the way we're going to be affected, particularly with those that are here on a more permanent basis. The transients, we may only get one shot at. But these, a lot of these people we're talking to, it's a continuing conversation. And we've got an opportunity to do that. And, you know, I may be on the totally wrong track here. And if you think that I am, I would like to hear that now but one of the things that i got from him listening i mean he's argumentative certainly but i i also get the sense that on some level he is seeking because it's he's he's put an awful lot of thought and even if half of what he's saying is true a lot of effort into learning about different uh, Kenny, uh, yeah, Kenneth, whatever. And I think even though it's misguided, it comes through that his concern for his mom raising up the sister's kids and stuff is true concern for his mom, you know, and... Well, I, I would not argue that at all. I mean, it's kind of because there's a part of me that's thinking, well, if this guy just wants to argue, he's way more glib than I am. He's, it's... I'm going to lose that debate every week, but if it's somebody that's truly is seeking in their own yeah, way. Here, if here's you know. another thing that happened with regard to that. I, he never said that he, because I, I, I offered to bring him reading material. I said, you know, you said this, and, and I've got material in my library that clearly shows by, from experts that what you're saying is not, is not true. Uh, would you read it if I would bring it to you? I'll bring it to you and loan it to you. Not interested. I mean, that, that was always his bottom line. Well, I just live here and now and am not interested. I'm not taking away from his sincerity at all. I think he was genuinely hurt by those in his mother's church. And I think he was genuinely hurt by his mother forcing him to go to church after he was hurt. I think all of those things are true. And it's all the more reason that I want to try hard to reach somebody like that. But here's, here's what they did. And Carol overheard part of this. If somebody gets stuck in a corner, one of the ways out is to try to shock you. And so he took off on a cursing line, and here's what I'd say to God. And he'd curse, and he'd say all of these things that were just very crude. And it was, it was meant to shock and to, to get some response from me. And I was determined just to be a, a blank wall and not be, not be shocked and not be turned off to the point of walking away, but just to, to hear him out and then come back with some answers. And all he did in that was build another straw man of who God is. So listen for the straw man argument. The straw man is to build something, a case for something that's weak, and then defeat that case. Build a, a, a case for something with an with a automatic uh, um, weakness built into the very core of it that you can go to the core and tear down. 
And so what he was doing, here's how it went. He'd present my argument and then defeat it. And then I'd go, wait a minute. And then he'd present another argument and defeat it. And I go, okay, can I answer that? No. I'm gonna, he'd present another argument and defeat it. And I, so I just kept collecting them until he got about four out. And I said, wait a minute, let's go back to the first one. And I showed him where it was just, it, it wasn't true. Yeah. There were a couple times, I think, where you said, wait a minute, you're making my argument for me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So there, there were times when he would go back and say, for instance, he got to a place that he, wa- he wasn't comfortable saying that the universe uh, had always existed. He had made, he'd, he first said it came into being, and then he came back and said, well, it must have always existed then, because I'd taken that away from him. Well, how can it have always existed? You just said you believe that it, di- that it hadn't always existed. So when he made the argument again that, that it had a beginning, I just let him talk. And when he got to the end, I said, well, you, you just made my argument for me. You know, that it, it does have a beginning. And then I come back to the original question. Who was the beginner? Who was the cause of that, that beginning? He's not the only one, but I did hear it a little bit. And while we're talking on this stuff, again, if any of these are rabbits you don't want to chase after right now, what is the deal with Lilith? And I mean, and people use two verses, you know, where it's male and female, he created them, and then, you know, and then he'll come back and say, taken from Adam's rib. And I, and I, I, th- we have friends who, you know, are in a church, and they, that's the first time I ever heard of Lilith, but it comes up here and there. What, what is the deal with that? Okay. Um, again, I, I, don't, I, there, I don't have anything on Lilith, but you can find him online. You can find the whole argument online. Um, what I would say is that if you'll come back and if something's not in our library, I'll know it. I don't have anything on Lilith at all. I mean, I, but you, you can go back and find it online and you can read it and then you can begin to deconstruct that. But, the, but what I want to do today is present I want you to, when you leave here, I want you to recognize a straw man argument. And a lot of times people will use something like, well, Lilith or Einstein or Tesla and somehow believe that that gives them authority, that automatically that's true. And a lot of times they don't even present the arguments well. So what, what Einstein actually said was not what he said that Einstein said. And I said, hey, I've got some stuff that'll show that's directly from Einstein that'll, that'll, that is his exact words. I can show you what you're saying is not true. Would you read it if I would bring it to you? I think it would benefit you. No. But do you understand what I'm talking about when I'm talking about a straw man now? Build an argument that has a weakness or, a, or the core is not there at all or the core is misrepresented. They just build a weakness light a match to it and burn it up in front of in front of you but he was a perfect example because he would go from creation to uh, quoting Luke to his mother's situation financially to all of these things and every time he was building straw men and then saying here's what you Christians think and then here here's why that's not true and here's what you Christians think and that's why that's not true and here's what you believe and that's not true at all and here's how I know it's not true um, when he gets through, nothing he said that Christians believe do Christians believe. Even if their church taught it, doesn't make it true. Even if the Crusades took place, and they did, doesn't mean that truly represents Christ. So I want you to recognize it and then go and be able to say at least that isn't the Christian position at all. And if you'd like to discuss this more, we can discuss it more, but that is not the Christian position at all. I'm sorry your church taught that. I'm sorry your mother has lived under that illusion all her life. I'm sorry that you tried to make a formula, a mathematical, financial, economic formula out of God's word. But that's not, that was never its intent. Yeah. Sorry, I feel I'm kind of hogging the mic here. Um, I think I can speak collectively for this little core group. Um, 
And if not, I apologize right now to anybody if I'm insulting any of you. If I'm understanding you correctly, when somebody says something like Einstein said or Tesla said or I, we're not educated anywhere near like you are, Dave. I, unless it's, I mean, there's some things I'm going to recognize from those people or go, eh, but I very well might not, and I kind of think we're all in that same boat. I, like I say, I apologize if any of you aren't in there with me. But so if I'm understanding you correctly, is it kind of like if it remotely doesn't ring true, we should sort of not argumentatively, but just sort of go on the assumption that it probably is part of this? I mean, I'm, I'm clear on this concept of what you're saying with the straw man, but to recognize. Um, yeah, I, I don't think you need to be assumptive with that at all because you don't want to misstate what any of those people's positions are. You don't want to do that. But what you can do is, is when you recognize something is not part of the doctrine of the faith, you can clearly say, you know, I'm sorry you had that represented to you that way. I'm sorry you grew up in that church teaching you those things. But let me just tell you and assure you, that's not the Christian position at all. That's something every single one of you can do. And then come back and do your research here and continue the conversation again some other time. Like the stuff like Tesla says and Einstein says, so to speak, is something that we can just maybe just yeah. I, pass I mean, over. I can deal with that because I've heard those arguments before and I've dealt with them before, and I and but I had to go back and research those at some point to get to the place that I knew how to respond to them, and that's the point I'm trying to make to you. All of us are starting, and I and I'm hearing stuff out there now. I mean, the whole thing about Ezekiel's wheels being flying saucers, maybe I missed that one, but I have I've never heard that. So that's going to cause me to go back and go, okay, I, I want to see what the commentators say about that too and see if I, can, if I can bone up on that to become better prepared to deal with those things. That's, that's one, other, one of those reasons I wanted to have this discussion. But I would not try to represent what Einstein or Tesla or somebody said unless you know it to be fact. But what they're doing is they're building something that has the uh, detrimental effect in terms of, of truly representing Christianity. And what you can say is, you know, I'm sorry that you grew up with that. I'm sorry you had that as a, as a representation of what you've thought all these years Christianity is. But I can assure you that does not represent what Christianity is. The Crusades do not represent what Christianity is. I mean, you can all, you, you, if you just have that, that one phrase and you recognize this is, this is, this is a lie wrapped in enigma with a thin layer of the truth on the outside. Then you can go to the core of that, the lie, and say, well, you know, I'm sorry. What you've said about this is certainly true, but this, this does not represent Christianity. You can, any one of you can come back with that and, and, and say those words and, and leave them with at least the understanding that what they've thought all of these years, at least from your viewpoint, is not Christianity. Now you can back that up with saying, I do have some, some books in our, the library of the church that I think would be very helpful to your understanding that are written by scholars a whole lot smarter than me. And if, if you're interested, I'll be glad to get those for you. Just, just come to me and tell me what the conversation was and I'll dig something out for them. But almost any apologetic issue we've got in the back room Anything you want to look into in terms of the scriptures, theological issues are in the front room. And you can go dig them out and, and find what, what the answers are and go back better prepared the next week to deal with it. And that's, that's what I want to have happen. And, and what that's doing is it's honing all of us to become better and better and better at sharing our faith with, with any kind of person out there. But today, recognize the straw man Practice deconstructing it, the, the ones that you've heard. Practice deconstructing those in your own mind. And then come back with some kernel of truth that will, that will truly represent what the Christian faith really is. So recognize it, deconstruct it, come back with a kernel of truth. It doesn't have to be a detailed explanation, just a kernel of truth. As I understand what God's Word says, you don't even have to quote a scripture. As I understand what God's word says, here's the truth concerning that. 
But don't, don't think because somebody talks loud or they're animated or they're strong personalities or they're in your face that they're telling you the truth. That doesn't mean they're telling you the truth. That doesn't mean they're truly representing what Christianity is. And when they start telling you what Christianity is, start looking for the straw man. Start looking for, okay, what, what, where is this guy going with this? What, what, what is it that he's going to say that does not truly represent Christ? And I've heard the Crusades, I, I would venture to say, a hundred times in the last five years. Uh, I've, I've heard so many of these things over and over and over again. And if you just get to where, okay, I know how to deal with that now, now bring science on it. I'll go research that and I'll, I'll know how to deal with that. But you're going to hear some of these things over and over again. I'm going to go out and find out more about spaceships tonight and figure out how to deal with that better than I could have dealt with it myself. So, yeah. So, what else have we got? Do you recall, if you're thinking back on it now that I've told you what a straw man is, can you think back on any conversations you've had where you've had a straw man presented to you and you just, and it sort of makes you feel helpless because they're telling you what Christianity is and then they're tearing it down. And you go, oh, I don't know. But if you recognize it, recognizing it is 90% of the battle. Yeah, I understand what that is. Now what I've got to look for is, is the what is the core lie, and, and leave them to defeat that lie with a kernel of truth and offer to bring them material that will document what you're saying so it's not just you and me. Okay? So can you think of any? Well, that's what I felt like I was running into all the time, all of this side every time we get close to anything important, then I, I call it changing the subject, but it's the straw man. <laughs> it's the straw man. And I do feel better equipped to just have a knowledge of what they're doing. I do feel better equipped. And I, and I feel stronger. Each time we go out, I feel stronger, you know, just doing going out. I think if we just keep going at it, we will build up and we will get stronger. The thing is, is to realize that, that what we're doing on the street does not end there. It doesn't, because if it ends there, it leaves all of us weaker rather than stronger. We've actually got to take some time to debrief ourselves and write this stuff down and come back and study it and, and work on it. But, yeah, you're right. There, and a lot of our, what's happened in our culture, I don't think, if you would say straw man just about anybody out there, they wouldn't even know what you're talking about. But you see it, again, watch the next political debate, even if you don't want to watch it. Watch it and listen for this, and you'll go, oh, my. Listen to it in advertising. Our culture teaches us this, even though we don't know what it is. It is a defense mechanism, and as Linda described it, it really is. It's a, it's a methodology of diverting your attention and then building something that's easily defeated. And then, then it leaves you looking silly if you don't answer them with something. Well, see, because this is what you believe. Look how silly this is. And we, what we've got to be able to say in a kind way is, no, that's not at all what Christians believe. Uh, you know, I'm sorry you were taught that. I'm, I'm sorry your mother was taught that. I'm not blaming her. But that's not what Christians believe. And I would like to say also that it's, I'm glad that we're talking about this kind of stuff like this. And it's, um, I'm no longer terrified to go there. Although sometimes, depending upon the crowd, I feel more or less comfortable. But uh, I find myself looking forward to it. Although I have to admit, I've not really ever gotten close to the Roman road with anybody. Just the way things, because I keep on running into people that I think would be simpler if it was somebody that had no knowledge whatsoever, just about. And I keep running into these really articulate, well-read people. But I think like Linda's saying now, and I also was really glad to hear your explanation of, um, 
like dealing with the Crusades, because I've always kind of wondered if it's poor form, if you will, to say, I don't, I don't care what the church said, <laughs> that was wrong. Mm -hmm. And, it, you know, and because that's been my belief for a long time. It's going, that's, that was a And, and that's how you want to deal with it, but you want to bring it back to, you know, just because a church teaches it doesn't mean that it's correct. Just because a, something sold in a Christian bookstore doesn't make it Christian. Just because you stand in a garage doesn't make you a car. You know, those kind of arguments are, are very real to people. And, and it was wrong. And any good Christian teacher today will tell you it was wrong. And that it, and the, the next step, though, is most important, that it no way represents Christ or his teachings. That's the connection you want to make. It's not just that the church was wrong. It's that it doesn't represent Christ and his teachings. And so that's, that's, the, that's what you want to leave people with is the understanding that what they have understood to be Christian is not Christian at all. And that it's not just me saying that. I'm glad to bring you documentation of what I'm saying. And if what we believe is that the Bible speaks of what Christianity is, then the things that are ripped from their context, like the text from, from the book of Luke, that says, well, you give and it will be given to you, pressed down, running over. Uh, and then it's, in, it's interpreted, or, trans, or it's not translated, it's interpreted to mean that that means that if you give money, you're going to get more money back, and you're going to treat that like some kind of magical financial formula then you're number one you're going about that from all the wrong position the the whole text concerns and we, everything we've talked about in luke up to this point concerns love and what real genuine biblical love is all about and if we're not doing that out of a love for god and we're doing it as, with the motives of getting back we're never going to see that kind that kind of return or any other kind of return because our motives are totally wrong. You know, everything in the text up to the point that we get there is on love and what biblical love is. So those are the kind of things you just need to notice. When somebody quotes a scripture, go back and say, okay, what came before, what came after, what's the total context of this, and then be able to deal with it. It's just like the, the first time I heard Cool Whip talk about Genesis 3.18, I went, okay, I know what that says, and, and I'm, I'm thinking to myself, what's the context, what's the context, what's the context? And finally it occurred to me, the context is the fall. It's sin. The context is the garden. You know, that, that's, the context is telling him not to eat of the tree. You know, that's what's happening there. So you have to, you have to, to go back and really just say, okay, I'm, I want to be better prepared and so the second time I heard him take off on that diatribe, I waited for him to finish, and I said, can I just say something? So I got in and explained the whole thing, just that this is not what the Hebrew is. It is plural. It's not talking about one thing. It's talking about all the plants of the earth. Uh, the context is the fall of man, the sinfulness that came into the world. That's what's taking place there. And the, the bottom line is right after that, it says, if you don't work, you don't eat. So what about that? So, you know, those are, how you present that has everything to do. I mean, the second time I heard him go into that, he was, he was all in my face. The first time it was kind of passive. But the second time he was all in my face with it. And so I didn't, I didn't mind coming back to him and saying, you know, well, this is what it's really all about. And, you know, the, the context of this is if you don't work, you don't eat. You know, what, how, how are you going to deal with that? So, you know, those are, you have to look at the situation that you're in and how, how about uh, the person that's just very passive? You know, how about the person that's just going to be arrogant and in your face? And, and the fact is, if you talk to people several times, if they're naturally arrogant to begin with, the third time you talk to them, they're going to be more so. They're going to be harder. They're going to be in your face more. And so every time you talk to them, you've got to be better prepared to deal with them. But if somebody's passive, I'm going to be passive pretty much back. Uh, if, if they're very strong and arrogant with me, I'm not going to be st strong in terms of screaming and yelling, but I'm not, going to, I'm not going to hesitate to say that's not what God's Word says, and here's the truth concerning God's Word. And, and lay it out there for them. Because if, if there's nothing else that came out of that conversation last Monday, it was, it, or 
Friday. It, it, what needed to happen was that I left him with things to think about, and every time he turned and ran to another argument, I knew that I had planted a seed that he couldn't deal with right then. And so that was my cue, okay, I planted a seed. So he turns and runs to another argument and gets to the end of that, and I plant another seed. He'll turn and run to another argument. That's the, if you see somebody changing subjects like that, be, be affirmed in the fact that you've planted a good seed. So then, when we go out next Friday, if he's there, are you going to try and talk to him, or are you going to wait and see if he comes up no, to I, you? The last, th the last part of that conversation the other day, and you all had already left, I said, you know, I'd, I'd really, I appreciate you talking to me because I always like to leave on a positive note. I appreciate the conversation. I thank you for, for being able to talk like this and not be antagonistic or confrontational, and I appreciate it. Uh, but, he, but the end of that was he said, well, nothing that you, that you can say or bring for me to read is going to make any difference in what I believe. So I said, Okay. That's kind of where I got to the first conversation in about six or seven minutes. But then I ended up talking to him all that time. But what made me talk to him longer the last time again it was that he kept misrepresenting Christianity. And when I see somebody do that, I feel like I've got to get them an, a, a, an answer that says that's not what Christians believe. And, and, and then come back, and if I have to do some research on it, I will, but I, I go back and I can say to him then, because uh, I haven't read, for instance, I haven't read, I've read enough Tesla to know that what he was saying was a misrepresentation of Tesla. But I haven't read Tesla extensively. I haven't read Einstein extensively, but I have concerning uh, atrophy and uh, the, cr the beginning of the universe and all the things that he talked about with regard to creation. Because initially he misrepresented uh, creation. He, he, he basically took the approach that the universe is expanding, and, and he started looking at it, okay, what if I reverse that and went backwards? What do I get to? And he got to one atom, and he wouldn't, and, and in order to solve the problem of getting to one atom, uh, he divided by zero. Well, you learn in the second or third grade not that you can't divide by zero, and then he admitted later on that he just, he, he, he couldn't explain that one atom and so he had to do something to get rid of it. And so he divides by zero. Well, that's not the solution. The solution is to, is to realize somebody had to create the atom. Yeah, and so, and for a long time he, he didn't, but he finally did say it's the largest mathematical mistake that he ever made. So I've, I've read enough of that to say, I, but if he, if he would have talked about anything else with regard to Einstein, I probably wouldn't have had any idea how to, how to deal with him. But I have read enough of him with regard to the creation to know that's not at all what he said. And I've read enough of Tesla to know that's not at all what he said. He didn't say he created energy. He, he transferred uh, from one form to another into energy with his, with his creations, his machines, his inventions. But he didn't, he didn't say he created energy out of nothing. Uh, he never presented it that way. So uh, the bottom line is, Look at it as an adventure. Look at it as an opportunity to get better at what we're doing. Do a little bit of homework. Just, just come in any time during the week. If you don't have a key, I'm here most of the time, except I am going to start taking off on Mondays. My wife's off on Mondays. I'm off on Mondays. So um, that, that's she. I, I get it Sunday afternoon to kind of unwind, and, and uh, I haven't been taking Mondays, but I'm going to take Mondays from here on. But that, um, any other time, I'm, I'm generally here, um, you know. <laughs> well, let, let me say this. I, I'm thankful for you all. I appreciate your faithfulness in going out. I appreciate the fact that for every one of us, it's taken courage to go do this. I'm not the exception to that. You know, I... I'm still learning. I come back every week and I look at it as an opportunity to learn. I look at it as an opportunity to go do, to study and say, okay, how can I be better prepared for this next time? And I, and I pray for that person that I'll tire next week. And then I'm gonna, I pray that I have another opportunity to talk to them. 
and then my beginning is just really easy. Well, Farron, you know, we talked about this last week. Can, can we continue that conversation? Because I've had a chance to do a little studying this week, and and I've, I've thought about you and thought about it a lot. And it shows your concern for them, you know, and that you really do care. And it, the bottom line is if we, if we genuinely do care, we'll do that. We'll spend some time boning up so that next time we can give better answers than we did the time before. And I, like I say, I'm not the exception to that. Uh, you know, I generally knew what I wanted to do with regard to the Genesis 3.18 argument and did it that second time that I heard him get so angry and in my face. But I had spent some time between the first encounter and the second encounter becoming even better prepared so that I knew all the intricacies of what the Hebrew was and how to deal with that. And every, every argument he made, I had, I had him an answer. And it was based in truth. And what I keep telling people, because we've become a culture that truth doesn't matter. We've become a culture that if, if I just think it, it, it that's what's going to be my belief system. Uh, but that's not, that's not reality. We don't deal with anything important in our lives that way. If the doctor tells us we need to have surgery, we go, well, I just don't believe I need surgery. Just don't believe it. I'm sorry. I don't believe it, so it must be true. We don't deal with things that way. Spiritual things we certainly shouldn't deal with that way. We should be looking for truth. And so that's all any of us should be doing. But if you, if you get stuck, come to me. And I may not know the answer, but I'll get us unstuck. Okay? <laughs> I'll, I'll promise you I'll get us unstuck. So um, thank you all for being here. Uh, Farron, would you dismiss us in prayer, brother?